first reading comes from Sirach, the 10th chapter. A wise magistrate educates his people, and the government of a prudent man is well regulated. As is the people's magistrate, so are his officials. As is the ruler of a city, so are its inhabitants. An undisciplined king causes the ruin of his people, whereas a city will prosper through the prudence of its rulers. The governance of the earth is in the hand of God. He will raise up the right leader over it at the proper time. All human success is also in the hand of God. It is he who confers honor upon the lawgiver. Do not become angry at every offense committed by your neighbor, and do not resort to acts of violence. Ignorance is hateful in the sight of both the Lord and man, and injustice is an abhorrent to both. Sovereignty passes from nation to nation as the result of injustice, ignorance, and wealth. Nothing is more evil than one who loves money, for such a person places his soul on sale. For what reason are dust and ashes proud? Even in life the body is subject to decay. A lengthy illness baffles the doctor. The king of today will be a corpse tomorrow. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Our second reading comes from Hebrews, the fourth chapter. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest, so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. For the word of God is living and active, 
sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be Holy Gospel according to St. Luke. Glory when a great crowd was gathering and people from town after town came to see him, he said in a parable, a sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and were trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it, and some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture, and some fell among thorns. And the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. For others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, the ones along the path are those who have heard, then the devil comes and takes away the word from their ears, so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy, but these have no root, they believe for a while, and in time of testing fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go out on their way, they are choked by the cares and riches and pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, 
Hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Christ. By the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, we are bold to confess. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffering with the Holy Spirit, who is crucified by the Spirit. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living. 
pastor gets lost in the service, you know, he's not used to reading on the papers. That, my contact lenses, the days for technical difficulties. The Word of God is living and active. This is most certainly true. Last week we had a reading from Tobit, and this week we have the reading from Sirach. I had some questions from some folks who weren't at Wednesday Bible Studies. A few years ago we covered all of the official Concordia study Apocrypha. It's a companion volume. Every time we release a new study Bible, there's a raging debate whether or not to include the apocryphal books in the study Bible or not. There's a lot of confusion, particularly in the United States, where Lutherans adapted to life surrounded by other denominations, where they kind of shied away from doing things that their neighbors accused them of being too Catholic. But because the Apocrypha have been around since as long as the church in the West, as long as they have existed, Luther himself preached sermons on the Apocrypha. They are cited frequently in our confessions and our documents. It's easy to lose sight of the fact that there was no single printed edition of the Bible until the invention of the printing press. Most Christians for most of Christian history lived without ever laying eyes on a complete Bible. Most congregations were lucky, lucky if they had one copy of one book. For many of them, they were books unknown to us. Some Christians lived their entire life of faith, lived and died with only readings from the book of Tobit or the book of Judith being read at their local congregation. So it's kind of a shame that we got away from them. I'm glad there's the full Lutheran study Bible version of it with the study notes. It's really interesting stuff. The history of the coming together of the canon can be very confusing to people, but the Bible did not fall out of the sky on golden plates to be translated miraculously. If God had delivered his scripture to us in that fashion, it would be a lot simpler. It would also be a lot more complicated in its own way. If the Bible had been handed to us complete and whole from heaven, it would be a miracle. So you would either believe it or not. You would have to believe it or not believe it. It's much more complicated that God delivers his word to many different people over thousands of years in multiple places and languages that leaves us to uncover archaeologically different, slightly different manuscripts here and there and piece it together. It seems so much less reliable, and yet it's far more reliable because we can dig it up and find old pieces of it, find pieces from here and there and everywhere, compare and contrast. It gives one a horrible headache at seminary when you have to remember the names of all the major manuscripts and look at the languages. And Hebrew is a horrific penance I don't wish on anybody, but that's how it goes. The word of God delivered in such a fashion is verifiable, at least it's researchable. You can see it by its continuity. And over multiple authors, we see what we should see. Different vocabularies, different languages, different nuance, but always the fingerprints of the same God. God who struck Paul with blindness until the scales fell from his eyes. Many of us missed that that's a direct reference to what God did in the book of Tobit. When Tobit was struck with blindness and when it was healed, scales fell from his eyes. By not knowing that book, we miss the reference. So the word of God that's given to us is alive, it is living, it is active. It is not actually found in the printed word of the text. It's in what is conveyed. It is the word of God spoken, the word of God preached, the word of God as it was originally written, handwritten by those to whom it was revealed and inspired. For us, it makes it a lot more complicated to find, but again, a lot more verifiable. The real question when dealing with the efficacy of the word of God, finally, he's getting to the gospel text. What kind of soil are we dealing with? This is what Sirach is speaking of in passing. The type of king determines the type of cabinet. The type of magistrate determines who his advisors are. The population of a city determines the nature and character of that city. Different types of soil. 
soil in this world, which is fallen and sinful and weak and frail, which needs the word of God to make it alive again, where even in this world, even a king is a king today and a corpse tomorrow. Keeping that in mind then, what sort of soil are we dealing with? Now there's a lot of different ways to interpret the parable in the Gospels. Most of them are, well, not very good. I could easily give you a long lecture that says, what kind of soil are you? Are you being rocked today? Are you worn down along the path? Well, you ought to be a better kind of soil so that you can grow fruit for the Holy Ghost. But if I did that, that would be putting the onus entirely on you. That would be saying that it's up to you to decide what kind of soil you're going to be. Make a decision for Jesus and walk a certain path, except we don't do that. We're the ones that were a king yesterday and a corpse today. Being sin, in sin, from the fall into sin, from the garden of Mom, means we are dead in sin. And the dead do not save themselves. The dead do not make a decision for Jesus. The dead do not pull themselves up by their bootstraps and do good work. And certainly soil has absolutely no say in what sort of soil it is. But the parable then serves two functions. First, for the church of Jesus Christ, as it extends into the world, bearing witness of this word that is living and active, a sharp sword. This word as we deliver it to the world, we have to be aware of what kind of soil we're dealing with. There's all sorts of soil out there in the world, varying degrees of receptive to non-receptive. Brothers and sisters, we are living in a time where agriculture and a word of God, so to speak, is horrifically difficult. We are in a spiritual drought, or rather, a truth drought. In the 20th century, we really thought atheism and evolution were going to be the undoing of people's faith, but instead, it's weird pagan beliefs that cover an entire spectrum. The old religion of multiple gods and every single person is their own god has been revived in new and terrible ways. What kind of soil is that, and how do we reach out to our neighbor? How do we reach out to people with the truth? Do we spend endless hours shoveling the seeds of God's word onto rock, onto a war-down path, onto the dry and dead husks of the walking dead zombies that populate our world? No matter what we pour on the corpse of today, it will not again become the king of yesterday. Time takes its toll, history marches on, culture is different, the characteristics of those in the city determine the nature of it, just like a king determines his cabinet and a magistrate, his advisors. The world takes as its counsel the things that tickle its fancy, feed its flesh, and we have literally transitioned from a culture of overwhelming pleasure of drugs, sex, and whatever, to those mutilating their own flesh to conform it to their own image. The world has gone mad, and the question must be asked, what kind of soil is the world? I tricked you though, didn't I? Did you catch that? What kind of soil is out there in the world and how are you going to decide to plant your seed? That's actually the second terrible way to preach this parable. While we as the Church of Jesus Christ, extending from eternity into time, have the obligation to do what we do in our entire life and existence, bear witness to the truthfulness of God's word that comes down from him that which is living and active. Though we definitely are obligated by his calling, sanctification, and work through us to be a light to the darkness of the world, it is not for you and I to obsess over legalisms or questions of who is worthy or when they are or when they might be. St. Paul, our parish namesake, was an enemy and persecutor of the church who took Christians away to be murdered but when Jesus chose him on the road to Damascus, he becomes a martyr eventually for the faith. That St. Paul enters into heaven to the rejoicing and cheers of the people that he set there by murdering them is the scandal of the cross. And it reminds us that none of us knows when the word of God, which is living and active, will do its work because it brings us back to the real meaning of the parable. Nobody in their right mind, having grown up on a farm, 
Nobody in their right mind plants their seed in rock. Nobody tries to plant wheat in their driveway. It's a well-worn path. Nobody wastes seed or effort in this manner. The parable is not about you and me. The parable is not even about farming, though the imagery is. The parable is about the work of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, come into the world to die for our sins and rise again, to cancel out the debt of every sin that has ever been from the beginning of time until the end of it, redeeming everyone who ever lived and ever will live, everything that is in his hand he made in his cosmos. This God wanders the world throwing out the seed and he is the one that loves the world enough that he pays no attention to where. He throws this seed on the rock, he throws it on the path, he throws it among thistles. Because he loves all equally, he does not withhold where he throws the seed. And the best part is that only he who is fully God and fully man is capable of making a good crop grow on rock, in desert, among thistles, on the well-worn path. The parable is all about the work that Jesus is doing that he is doing through his church with his word what he is doing through his church in the sacraments that the word made flesh working from eternity into time through his church casting this seed under the world the man that loves every filthy degenerate in the world as much as he loves every filthy degenerate sitting in these pews the one who has come into the flesh to cleanse us of our sin to take it away by his blood on the cross the one who calls every, every murderer, thief, every pervert and degenerate that each and every one of us are at some place in the darkness of our hearts. Why, I lost my train of thought. Everything that we are in the darkness of our thoughts and our interior sin. Jesus Christ, God and man, who has entered the world to cleanse it, is the one who cast the seed all willy-nilly, everywhere, anywhere, all at once, because he loves all the types of soil equally, and he is able to make it take root. So yes, in our day-to-day -day lives, we might wonder about soil, and I'm certainly not advising you to plant your carrots in a terrible place in your garden. That would be extending the metaphor too far. But it's the reminder of Jesus that his work in the world, that is able to turn us, each type of wretched, dry, rocky, nasty, well-worn, evil soil that we are, that we can be brought here wash and absolve, that we can be fed his body and blood at this altar, to be a well springing up in us to eternal life. He is able to do it for every sinner that ever existed and ever will exist. He will, as he promised, restore everything that is his to himself, even the vastness of the cosmos, even every single bee and blade of grass, the one who lets nothing escape but fulfills all his promises it's Jesus who does the sowing, Jesus who does the work, Jesus who delivers the gift he promised of everlasting life in his name. Amen.
pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their need. Almighty and everlasting God, our Father in heaven, look with mercy on us, your needy children on earth, and sanctify us by your name through the true teaching of your word and of servant love. Graciously turn from us all false doctrine and evil living which profane your name, preserving us this parish and your sin. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless our enemies and persecutors. Be with all those who hate you in the gospel of your Son. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ by faith. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Strengthen us through all our struggles in this world of bodily and spiritual health, crucifying our wills with Jesus raising us up with him. Into your merciful hands, we command especially Reverend Jane, Audrey, Mary, Callum, Lynn, Barb, Anne, Brenda, Megan, Carl, Nathan, Kevin, Ryan, Sue, Mark, David, Margie, Landon, Tabitha, Amaya, Mira, Ezekiel, Rich, Jeff, Rhonda, and all who are in need, entrusting them to your infinite wisdom, Lord, in your mercy. Yeah, yeah, our prayer. Prayer. Grant us strength to persevere in honest and righteous living day to day. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares. Help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. Help us by your spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and play, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Keep us steadfast in baptismal grace, your washing of regeneration that we may rejoice in a good conscience before you, and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Be with our nation and with all those in positions of leadership, authority, and direction. Be with all your people here, especially Sue, Debbie, and Audrey, keeping all according to your wise counsel and heavenly care, delivering us from all evil of both soul and flesh, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We trust the Lord in your great mercy to love and hear us and to answer our prayers. For to you alone we ascribe all glory, honor, and power, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting in his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, Father, who who art in heaven, heaven. Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And the power of the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Remembering our holy patriarchs, prophets, priests, and kings, apostles, evangelists, martyrs, and all his saints, let us commend one another in our whole life unto Christ our God. For he lived and reigned with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and ever, and unto the ages of ages.